Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome. Welcome to the session. I hereby formally open the session and I welcome you all to the public defense of Mr. Michael Abdul Mashi. Uh, Mr. Michael Abdul Mashi has presented to the faculty of KU Leuven uh, his PhD thesis on the topic spectroscopy of spherically distorted massive stars, testing internal mixing and stellar evolution in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of PhD in science, astronomy and astrophysics. He shall now publicly defend his PhD thesis. Uh, before we invite him to give a presentation of about uh, 45 minutes about his work, I'd like to introduce first the members of the examination committee. So maybe um, to start with, uh, I am Ronnie Keppens. I am working at the Center for Plasma Astrophysics at the Department of Mathematics at KU Leuven. And uh, I'll first uh, introduce the foreign members from our jury. So we will start with uh, Professor Andrei Prasha from uh, Villanova University in the United States. Uh, then I have to uh, bring apologies from uh, Paul Pols at uh, Rabaut University and Miriam Garcia at Centro de Astrobiologica, uh, who are unfortunately unable to join this, but they were actually already present during the uh, pre-defense. Uh, on your screen, you already see our colleague, uh, Professor De Koter, who is both work, uh, working at the uh, University of Amsterdam and uh, Leuven. Uh, then uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Michael Becker from University of Liège. Uh, this is followed by Professor Katrin Kolenberg from our university. And then uh, also my colleague uh, John Zundquist from the Institute for uh, Astronomy. And then uh, last but not least, the promoter of this work, uh, Professor Jürg Sana, also from the Institute of Astronomy. So with that, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Michael abdul Masi to uh, defend his work uh, to uh, the public. Thank you very much. So th first I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining today and tuning in. Um, uh, over the next 45 minutes, I'm gonna tell you about the research that I've been doing over the past four years, which has culminated in this thesis that I'm presenting today, which is entitled Spectroscopy of Spherically Distorted Massive Stars testing internal mixing and stellar evolution. Now, before we get into the work that I've done, let, I'm gonna take you back four years, back to September 14th, 2015, when at 5.51 in the morning, the LIGO detectors detected the first gravitational wave. What the detectors actually detected were ripples in the fabric of space, which resulted from the merging of two black holes. Now, black holes are the corpses that massive stars leave behind when they, uh, when they die. And the merging of, th of these two black holes was a very big discovery because it proved definitively that black holes not only form in binary systems, but also that they form in very close binary systems. This is important because this challenged some of our theories of stellar evolution. To form black holes in such a uh, configuration and so close to each other is very difficult. And we need to uh, stellar evolution theories that allow us to form black holes in such a configuration. One such way that we can do this is stars that are very well mixed before they turn into black holes. And before we go into that, uh, I'm going to give you first a little bit of background information. In the next slide, you'll see uh, some terms that are highlighted in blue, and these are uh, words that are mentioned in the title of my thesis. Uh, so these are important. So at least uh, at the end of the talk, I hope that you will be able to at least understand what my title says. So the first question uh, that we need to ask ourselves is what is a massive star and why do we care about them? Put simply, a massive star is a star that's hot enough that it can burn carbon and oxygen in its core. And what that corresponds to is stars that are about eight times the mass of our sun or greater. Now, the more massive a star is, the hotter and denser its inner regions are, which means that it can produce more energy and uh, the light that it gives off peaks uh, more towards the blue. This means that uh, massive stars appear more blue while less massive counterparts appear more red. So one consequence of this is that uh, 
massive stars give off a large portion of their light in the UV region of the spectrum. And this is important because this allows massive stars to do several things. One, it allows them to drive strong stellar winds from their surface. So material that's just around the massive star, uh, the flux that's coming from the, the, the photons that are coming from inside of the star is able to push this material out away from the star, creating a wind. Another consequence of, these, of this UV flux is that it's able to destroy any dust or molecules that are in the environment around the star. It's also able to ionize the gas in the region. So what this means is that massive stars drive both the chemical and the mechanical evolution of their host galaxies. So understanding how massive stars live, how long they live, and how they die is vital to our understanding of the universe in general. So let's take a look a little bit at how stars live their lives. All stars are born in star forming regions. They all begin their lives in the same way. They begin their lives as large clouds of gas, which under its own gravity will begin to collapse. As the very center of this uh, gas becomes hot and dense, uh, as it gets hot enough and dense enough, eventually uh, it'll reach temperatures at which hydrogen can begin fusing to helium in the core. We call this phase of evolution the main sequence. So the time in which a star is burning hydrogen into helium in its core is the main sequence. And a star will spend about 90% of its life on the main sequence. However, depending on the initial mass of the star as it was formed, it'll live its life in a very different ways, as well as its structure, the interior structure of the star will be very different. So a star similar to uh, our sun will begin its life um, yeah, uh, as, as a star like our sun, but will end its life uh, as a white dwarf. The more massive stars, the ones that uh, we're interested in today, um, will evolve and as, as they do so, they will eventually end their lives as a supernova explosion, uh, leaving behind either a black hole or a neutron star remnant or just nothing at all. But a common feature of stellar evolution is that these stars are born from clouds of gas, they live their lives, dies, and then they re-enrich the environment around them, adding more gas for the next generation of stars to form. So as I mentioned, the structure of the star will change depending on how much mass it has. For massive stars, uh, the core of a massive star is convective. And what this means is that the primary mode of heat transfer in the star is convective bubbles that are moving uh, large scale circulations that are moving within the, the core itself. Now this implies that uh, the core is very well mixed. Now the envelope on the other hand, the outer regions of the star um, are radiative. And what that means is that in the primary method to transfer uh, heat is radiation. So photons that are carrying the heat away from, uh, from the center of the star. So this implies that the core is very well mixed in a massive star, but the envelope doesn't necessarily need to be. And as the star evolves, an important uh, fact is that the core will begin to contract and the envelope will begin to expand. So let's take a closer look at what's actually happening inside of the core of these massive stars. These stars are fusing hydrogen into helium via the CNO cycle in their cores. Now the CNO cycle is a catalytic cycle whereby four hydrogen atoms are converted into one helium atom, neutrinos, positrons, and gamma rays, and energy. But the most important thing that we're interested here is the conversion of, of hydrogen into helium. Now, I mentioned it's a catalytic reaction, and what that means is that carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen help facilitate this reaction. However, they're not used up themselves. This means that your total number of carbon plus nitrogen plus oxygen atoms in your core always remains the same. They can change between themselves, but uh, they, they, will, they will remain the same. However, the ratio of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen doesn't necessarily have to stay the same. Each of these reactions takes place at a different rate. Uh, and in particular, this reaction down here, this nitrogen 14 to oxygen 15 reaction, is the slowest reaction of this cycle. What that means is that you begin to get a buildup of nitrogen uh, because it takes a lot longer for it to be converted to oxygen. Now, what that means is that your nitrogen abundance in your core will begin to rise while your carbon and oxygen abundances will begin to fall uh, to compensate. Because as I, as I said, the C plus N plus O always needs to remain the same. 
Now, usually this is only happening, well, this is only happening in the core. However, usually we don't see evidence of this on the surface of the star. However, if you do have uh, efficient mixing between your core and your envelope, then we do start to at some times uh, see this at the surface. So if you can mix material between your core and your envelope, this allows you to bring fresh material from the core into the, uh, sorry, fresh material from the envelope into the core. And this allows you to extend the life of your star because it, the star has more fuel to burn. Uh, as well, uh, when you bring the process material from the core into the envelope, uh, if, you're efficient, if your mixing is efficient enough, then this could end up at the surface, in which case uh, you can see evidence of, these, uh, of this mixing. Now, if the mixing is efficient enough, then the star can enter what we call the chemically homogeneous evolution regime, where the entire star becomes mixed and completely chemically homogeneous. So let's look at this a little bit closer. So as I mentioned, the stars, uh, uh, as they, un un in their typical conditions, what will happen is that the core uh, will be converting hydrogen into helium, and the core will begin to come to become helium rich. As this happens, uh, the core will begin to shrink and the envelope will compensate and begin to expand. Now, if you have efficient mixing in between your core and your envelope, then what happens is that you can actually cause your entire star to be chemically homogeneous so that the helium enrichment isn't only showing up in the core, it's also showing up uh, in the envelope as well. The interesting consequence of this is that instead of expanding as the star evolves, as it normally would do, under chemically homogeneous evolution, the star is actually going to contract. This will become very important, we'll see uh, in a little bit. So what actually causes the internal mixing? Well, there's two main theories uh, that allow us to uh, mix a star. Um, one arises from rotational mixing, so uh, our star that is rapidly rotating, and another is from internal gravity waves or pulsations. Now, my thesis is mainly focused on the rotational mixing uh, mechanism. So we'll look into that in a little bit more detail. So recall that as the star is evolving, the core will shrink and the envelope will expand. Now, conservation of angular momentum tells us that if you have a spinning object and it gets smaller, then it will begin to spin faster. Imagine an ice skater spinning very fast uh, with their arms out and then they bring their arms in and they spin even faster. And this same principle applies to the cores of, of massive stars. So uh, the core will begin to spin faster and consequently, and the exact opposite will happen uh, uh, with the envelope, which as it expands, will begin to spin slower. And what we end up having is at the boundary between the core and the envelope, we have a, uh, a shear, um, or, or we have a difference in, in, the, in the velocity of the, uh, uh, of the core and the envelope. And this leads to shear instabilities, which allow turbulent uh, swirls and eddies uh, to occur between the core and the envelope. And this allows mixing between your core and your envelope. However, this is a very localized uh, uh, mixing. So uh, the, the shear instabilities will not lead to your entire star becoming chemically homogeneous. We need another mechanism that allows this to happen. Uh, and this is another consequence of, of rotation, actually, and that is that as a star is rotating, it will begin to deviate from spherical symmetry. A non-rotating star would appear perfectly spherical. However, as it begins to rotate, it will begin to flatten out a little bit. So just as if you were to take a water balloon and throw it up in the air and spin it, it would begin to pancake. Stars do something very similar. So as a star is rotating, its equator will begin to puff out while the poles will stay uh, in almost the exact same place. So as the star, if you were to take a cross section of the star, it would begin to look something like a, like a football as it's spinning, an American football, uh, as it's spinning faster. Um, and this distortions from spherical symmetry is important uh, because it has several effects. So the first and most obvious one is that the radius of your star across the surface changes. So here at the pole, you have a much smaller radius. You're much closer to the center of the star than you are at the equator. Now, what that corresponds to is 
a change in your surface gravity. So if you were to stand on the surface of your star on the poles, so up here, you would experience a much higher surface gravity because you're much closer to the core. Whereas just the opposite would happen if you're on the equator. If you're on the equator, you would experience a lower surface gravity. This also leads to a temperature difference across the surface. So your poles are gonna be much hotter because they're at a much lower gravity and your equator is gonna be much cooler. This is important because this difference in temperature across the surface of a star can lead to something that we call Eddington sweet circulations, which are large scale circulations whereby material is brought from the hotter regions on the surface to the cooler regions and then back down into uh, the envelope very close to the core regions. So if we have the shear instabilities, which is causing mixing between the core and the envelope, and then the Eddington sweet circulations, which then causes mixing, which brings material from near the core up to the surface, the combination of these two uh, can lead to chemically homogeneous evolution. And there are other rotational uh, mixing mechanisms as well, um, but uh, we won't go into those right now. Now, this, deviate, the, this temperature difference across the surface comes from your deviation from spherical symmetry. However, there are other ways to get these deviations aside from just rotation. And another one is binarity. If your star is born with a companion, and this companion is far enough away, then the star will still live its life as if it were single. It'll still appear uh, a spherical and will behave in the same way. However, if the star is born much closer or, or evolves to become much closer to its companion, what you can end up seeing is that the shapes of the stars begin to deviate from, from spheres. And if we go to the extreme and the stars are born even closer to each other, you can form systems that look like this. And we call these over contact systems. And these are also gonna become very important soon. Now, binaries uh, are very important uh, for massive stars because we expect that most, if not all massive stars will be born in binary systems. And of these uh, binary systems, we expect that 70% of them will interact with a companion during their lives. And these interactions can have a very large effect on the lives of these systems. Uh, these systems can exchange mass with one another, they can exchange angular momentum, uh, they can affect the spins of each other, and this is very important. Great, so what about those black holes that I mentioned in the beginning? How does all of this relate to that? So remember I mentioned that as a star evolves, it will begin to expand. Uh, under normal circumstances. And usually this, these stars can reach radii of several hundreds of stellar radii, of solar radii, uh, even to up to a thousand solar radii. However, to form a gravitational wave, the black hole, black hole system that you, uh, uh, that you form needs to be within a few tens of solar radii of each other. <clears throat> so if your stars are big, are, will uh, expand to be several times uh, that separation, then this produces a bit of a problem. If your stars are born right next to each other and then uh, they expand, then instead of collapsing into black holes right next to each other, they will instead merge before they ever get to that point. So we need a mechanism that either allows you to start your black holes very far apart, or sorry, start your stars very far apart, and as they evolve, move closer together and form black holes next to each other, or have stars that begin their lives very close to each other, but don't expand. And the second mechanism is the one that uh, we're focusing on here. And this is, if you have very efficient internal mixing, then you can get around this problem. So let me bring you back to this picture again. Your typical evolution, you expand. However, if you undergo chemically homogeneous evolution, instead of expanding, your stars actually contract as they evolve. Now, if you have a binary system that is very close, say like an over contact system, then you have your system already in the configuration that you need to form gravitational waves. And if they're evolving chemically homogeneously, then instead of expanding, as they evolve, they will shrink and they'll be able to form black holes right next to each other. Now, another benefit of uh, forming black holes like this, or, or another, uh, I, I guess, uh, positive aspect of this evolutionary pathway, um, uh, goes back to one of the things that I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk, and that is that massive stars drive stellar winds away from them. 
Okay, And as they're pushing this material away from them, they're losing angular momentum. So a massive star that's spinning fast, that has strong winds, will eventually lose this very fast rotation. Now, on a binary system, however, if you have a, a, a close binary like this one, their mutual gravitational attraction will, uh, and their exchanging of angular momentum will allow them both to maintain their very fast rotation rates despite the fact that they're losing mass. And this is important because this allows you to have both of your stars become chemically homogeneous and stay chemically homogeneous as they evolve. Now, this theory relies very heavily on rotational mixing. So how exactly do we see whether or not uh, this is happening? How do we look for evidence of mixing? Now, I mentioned in the core, in the CNO cycle is converting uh, hydrogen into helium. So your helium abundance is going to be arising in the core, but also from the CNO cycle, your abundances of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are changing. So your carbon abundance will go down, your nitrogen abundance will go up, and your oxygen abundance will go down. So if we can look for these abundance changes on the surface of our star, then we'll have an idea of whether or not our star is uh, mixing efficiently. Similarly, we can look, look at the surface temperatures of the star because mixing um, will tend to increase the surface temperature. So how do we actually measure these things? And we do this through what we call spectroscopy. Now, if you were to take a star and you were to beam all of its light uh, through a prism and you were to break it up into its uh, different wavelengths, what you would see is that uh, its spectrum would look something like this. It would look like a rainbow, but the rainbow is not continuous. There are, there are dark spots uh, all throughout uh, uh, this rainbow. Um, and us astronomers like to look at this in a different way where pretty much we convert each of these uh, colors into um, well, into a wavelength, and then we look at how bright the light that is coming from each of those wavelengths is. And what we find is we find something like that looks like this, and this is a spectra and or a spectrum, and each individual feature that we see in the spectrum corresponds to a specific chemical element. So by looking at a spectrum of a star and looking at which spectral lines are present and in what ratios they are, then we can get information about the surface uh, uh, element abundances as well as the surface temperature and many other important diagnostic parameters. Once we uh, observe these spectra to actually get uh, uh, this information out, we need to compare the observed spectra with models, with, with, with spectral models, which we generate uh, using radiative transfer codes. Uh, and what these codes do is pretty much they model how the radiation moves through a star and uh, how uh, the spectral lines will look um, as a result of that. Now, an important thing to note is that in massive stars, we need to use a special type of radiative transfer code. And these uh, is radiative is called NLTE, which stands for non-local thermodynamic equilibrium. And pretty much what this means is that, uh, well, the local thermodynamic equilibrium uh, is an assumption that holds in low mass stars, whereby in a local region in the star, the temperature is fairly constant, is in equilibrium. However, in massive stars, this is not the case. In massive stars, in a local region, you cannot assume that the temperature will be uh, uh, fairly constant. So because of this, we need to use special radiative transfer codes to actually uh, model these spectra. And one radiative transfer code that uh, we'll be using throughout the thesis for uh, a lot is uh, fast wind. So um, keep that in mind. Now, due to these NLTE um, effects, uh, computing uh, these radiative transfer models is very computationally expensive. And because of this, these are usually done in one dimension. And what that means is that you're assuming that your star is a sphere. And as I mentioned before, we're looking for uh, evidence of rotational mixing in all of these uh, all of these stars are by definition distorted. So how does this affect our uh, modeling of these systems? And this is one of the major questions that we want to answer in this thesis. In fact, now we can get into what the goals of this thesis really are. And I can summarize them into three main points. First, we want to investigate the chemically homogeneous evolution pathway and assess its viability in forming gravitational wave sources. Second, we want to observationally evaluate rotational mixing theory for massive stars, uh, uh, which we're going to do um, 
by looking at temperature increases and uh, helium enhancements, uh, and sorry, helium and nitrogen abundance enhancements and carbon and oxygen uh, depletion. Um, and finally, uh, we can determine the impact of modeling massive stars in 1D um, because a lot of our analysis techniques rely on spherical one-dimensional um, models. So uh, let's first get into what our analysis techniques are available for analyzing um, the spectra of, of massive binaries. So this is an observed spectrum uh, of an overcontact system. Uh, and what you see is that instead of your very nice uh, peaks like we saw in the, in the spectra that I showed you earlier, what we have is we have what seems to be a double peaked uh, uh, lines in, in every single one of our lines. And this is because the spectrum that we're seeing is the spectrum that's coming from the entire surface of the star at the same time. So what that means is that since these stars are rotating fast, while this star is moving towards us very fast, uh, it will be all its whole sh spectrum will be shifted towards the blue, towards lower wavelengths. While the other star, which is moving away from us, is going to be shifted to the red, to higher wavelengths. Now, this is important because this means that as the star is, or as the system is, is orbiting around each other, its spectral lines are moving back and forth over each other. So to look at what's happening at the surface of each one of these individual stars, the first thing that we have to do is we have to separate them. We have to figure out what the components or which portions of the spectrum are coming from the primary, from you know, uh, your first star, and which ones are coming from your secondary. And we do this um, by using uh, disentangling codes. So these rely on first, all of your observed spectrum, all of your observed spectra, and second, a radial velocity curve. So you can measure the movement of these lines back and forth uh, and calculate how the radial velocity that each individual component of your system has at any given time. Uh, and by constructing a radial velocity curve uh, and, and using uh, a set of observed spectra, then you can separate uh, the spectral contributions that are coming from your primary star or your secondary star. Now, disentangling comes with a few assumptions which are very important. The first one is that it assumes that the spectral signature is constant with phase. So this means that as your system is moving around, it's assuming that the spectrum that you are seeing of each individual star at any point in your orbit is always the same. Now, as I mentioned, these stars are three-dimensional and distorted, and because of that, they have different temperatures across the surface. They have different gravities across the surface, and this all leads to different spectral uh, contributions coming from different parts of the star. So for example, if you're looking here on this star, it's going to appear very different than if you're looking here. So this is an assumption that we have with disentangling that we need to, uh, uh, that we need to deal with. And uh, second, it assumes that your component stars are spherical. So it assumes that each, uh, uh, that uh, our system, instead of appearing as an overcontact system, uh, is instead two very close um, uh, spherical stars uh, that are right next to each other. Now, once the spectra are disentangled, then you can move on to uh, the spectral fitting, where we compare the, um, uh, the observed spectra that we get to the synthetic models. Um, and there's even more assumptions that we have to deal with here. So again, uh, the radiative transfer codes assume that your star is spherical, but further, they assume that each of your star is single and completely uh, separate from your other star. So now our picture is, instead of uh, our overcontact system looking like this, your disentangling moves it to this, and then our uh, radiative transfer code fitting, spectral line fitting, moves it to this, where you have two completely separate systems that are being fit um, uh, separately from each other. Uh, and a question that we need to answer is, is this representation of our system good enough to understand what's happening at this phase? Now, how can we better address uh, this issue? How can we try to remove some of these assumptions so that instead of representing our overcontact binary as two separate single star systems, where we can better represent the geometry? How can we do that? Well, we need something that allows us to accurately model the geometry of the system, and we need something that an appropriate radiative transfer code. 
I mentioned that most of the radiative transfer codes are one dimensional. So we need to come up with a way that kind of combines these two techniques uh, such that we can get the best of both worlds. And to do this, we're going to combine FastWind with another code called Phoebe. Now, Phoebe is a code that is used to model eclipsing binary light curves and radio velocity curves. So what a light curve is, is if you have your, your binary system and you were to measure the total amount of light that's coming from your system as a function of time, what you'd see is that at different phases, the star is, or, or the system is going to appear brighter or dimmer. So when one star is behind the other star, it's going to appear dimmer than when you're seeing both of them uh, edge on. So by modeling the surface of the stars or the surface of your systems and calculating what the light uh, that would reach you is and comparing that to the observed light curves, Phoebe allows you to determine what the geometry of your system is. So now Phoebe allows us to determine what the geometry is and FastWin allows us to determine what the um, spectral contributions are. So we can combine these two uh, to create a patch model. And what that means is that each individual uh, point across your surface is going to have a different spectral contribution. So how do we actually do this? So as I mentioned, Phoebe allows you to create a mesh that represents the geometry of your system. However, Phoebe also populates this mesh so with local conditions. So for example, each individual triangle here has its own individual surface gravity, temperature, radial velocity, uh, which uh, is used to determine um, the light that's leaving the system. So here I, I'm showing the temperature distribution across the surface of the star and I uh, have it inclined a little bit towards you. So instead of looking like this, you're looking at it a bit like this. Uh, and what that allows you to see is the very hot pole and uh, the much cooler um, uh, ridge regions. So now that we have the local conditions at every point along the surface, we can assign fast wind models to each triangle. And here I'm showing two uh, spectral lines, two helium lines, and the ratio of, of which uh, gives us information about the temperature. So here we can assign the hotter temperatures, uh, uh, fast wind models that correspond uh, to those temperatures, and uh, cooler regions, different spectral lines that correspond to those conditions. Uh, and we can do this for the entire surface of the star. Once we do this, we can add up all of the light that we're seeing across the surface, and we can come up with a, uh, a synthetic profile for the system as a whole. Now this whole process altogether is, is what we call the, uh, the patch model and uh, the specific code that I have developed, uh, I've named the spectroscopic patch model for massive stars or SPAMS for short. Um, and if you go through this process for each phase, so at each configuration, and you um, then look at them and compare them to the observed spectra at those same phases, you see something that looks like this. And what you can see is that our observed spectra is in black and the synthetic spectra that we generate from SPAMS is in red. And as you can see that the code is able to very nicely match the morphology of your lines. Not only that, it's able to match your, the broadening of the lines, it's also able to match the ratio between uh, your lines as well. And this is very important because this allows us to fit your entire spectrum, uh, fit your entire uh, system simultaneously. So you no longer need to separate your stars into two separate components and then fit each one individually. You can fit the entire surface of your star simultaneously. And this is important because this removes a lot of the assumptions that uh, were introduced using the other analysis techniques that I mentioned before. So now that I've discussed uh, SPAMs, we can get into the main results of this thesis. And all of these are made possible because of the development of, of SPAMs itself. Uh, so the first, and I'm gonna go through each of these points um, individually. The first one is that a proper consideration of the 3D geometry is important for accurate parameter estimation. So let us take a theoretical rapidly rotating star and we're going to model it first, assuming that it has spherical symmetry, that it is that is a, that it is a spherical star. 
Um, and the spectrum associated with that spherical star is indicated in black. If we then take the star with the exact same parameters and allow it to deviate from spherical symmetry and use spams to model the star, uh, this is the profiles that you're seeing in red. Now this particular star that I'm modeling is rotating very fast. It's rotating at 90% uh, of its critical rotation. Uh, so 90% of the speed that, or of the rotation that it would need to completely break itself apart. Um, and uh, I've also, I'm showing here different inclinations. So an inclination of 90, you're looking at it uh, edge on. So you're looking at the, uh, at the equator. Um, uh, an inclination of 60, the star is inclined a little bit towards you. An inclination of 30, um, you, it's even more inclined towards you. Now this is important because if you were to try, if we, if we assume that the red uh, spectral lines that we're seeing here better represent this, the surface of the star, if you were to try to use spherical models to fit these red lines, uh, to measure uh, uh, parameters such as temperature or helium abundance, you would measure incorrect values. So for example, here I'm showing you that the black line at, 30, at an inclination of 30 shows a much stronger helium one line than the red. And this implies that if you wanted to uh, uh, fit this red line using a spherical model, that you would need to have a much higher temperature than the real temperature. Just the opposite happens when we're looking at an inclination of 90 degrees, where here, the helium one um, line, uh, or rather the helium two line is a bit deeper uh, uh, than, in this, than in the distorted case. And here you would measure a temperature that's lower than your real temperature. At an inclination of 60, while the ratio of the two lines appears the same, what we see is that the red line does appears systematically less deep, which implies a lower helium abundance. And this is very important because this is showing that if you do not take into account the geometry of your system, that you will obtain incorrect parameters. You will obtain incorrect temperatures, incorrect abundances, which is very important. We can also see this if we look at over contact systems, if we compare uh, actual observed data of over contact systems um, and try to uh, uh, fit them with 1D models, which are represented in red, uh, and um, the SPAMS models, which are represented in blue. And here what I have is in each plot, I have uh, uh, an HR diagram, a hertzsprung russell diagram, which is a tool that astronomers use where we have luminosity plotted in on the, um, on the y-axis, which is pretty much your brightness, and temperature plotted on your x-axis, which is your temperature increasing uh, towards the left, which is important. And what we see here is that if we compare our red points to our blue points, we see that there seems to be a systematic shift to more luminous, uh, so higher luminosities, but also a higher temperature. So this is also showing that if you take into account the geometry of your over contact system, you also will obtain different uh, uh, parameters than if you uh, um, fit it with spherical models. And an additional um, uh, thing that we need to keep in mind is, are we able to better represent the spectral lines using uh, the, the SPAMS techniques and with the 1D techniques? And the answer is yes. If we look at the observed spectra at different phases, uh, which is plotted in black, and compare the green lines, which are the 1D techniques where we separate the, the, the stars, fit them each together, or, or fit them each separately, and then add their contributions back together and compare it to our black lines, what we see is that the green lines do not rep are not able to um, uh, match our models nearly as well, or mm -hmm. match the observations nearly as well as the red lines do. So not only are you obtaining incorrect parameters using the 1D approach, but you're also uh, not able to fit the spectrum nearly as well. So now we're gonna move on to the second main result that I wanna talk about, and that is that unaccounted for additional mechaniz mechanisms produce similar component temperatures and unequal mass over contact binaries. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but let's go through that. So I'm gonna draw your attention to the masses of the stars in this system. The first star is 26 solar masses, and your second star is 19 solar masses. What I have plotted here in black are evolutionary tracks corresponding to different um, masses. So uh, we have uh, 20, 25, 30, and 40 solar masses. 
we also have several different lines corresponding with each mass that corresponds to different rotation rates. Now, based on the geometry of this particular system, we know that it's rotating at about 330 kilometers per second. So very close to, the, to these solid uh, black lines. Now, I mentioned one of the stars is 26 solar masses and one of the stars is 19 solar masses. If we look at the 25 solar mass track, which is closest to the 26, what we see is that both stars appear to be falling along the same track. However, our other star, our secondary star is 19 solar masses. It should be somewhere down here. And if you also notice these 20 solar mass tracks, there are no tracks that allow the star to evolve all the way up here into this regime. So this means that there's some additional mechanism that we are not taking into account that is allowing your stars to equalize or, or, or to, to, um, uh, be, to have much similar temperatures to each other uh, than we would expect. And the third main result that I wanna discuss is that the observed temperatures and abundances uh, cannot be reproduced with rotational mixing theory. So again, I'm gonna come back to the same plot. If we were to just based on the temperature decide whether or not this star is uh, appears that it is mixing efficiently. By fitting models, uh, by fitting evolutionary tracks uh, for this 25 solar mass case, we see that to represent the locations of these objects, we would need a rotation rate of something like 500 kilometers per second. Now here, a higher rotation rate uh, corresponds to more efficient mixing. So, uh, this is telling us that based just on your temperature and your luminosity, you need very efficient mixing to get these temperatures. However, if we were to look at the abundances, we see a very different, uh, a very different uh, picture. So here I have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen abundances plotted for your primary star here and your secondary star here. So your top one is your more massive star, your 26 solar mass star, and your bottom one is your 19 solar mass star. On your y-axis, I have the chemical abundance and on the x-axis, I have the age. So I remember from the CNO cycle, inside of the core, you should be enhancing your nitrogen and depleting your carbon and oxygen. Now, if the star is not rotating at all, which corresponds to uh, uh, the V-rot of zero, then you would never see this change on the surface of your star because it's staying in the core and not being mixed efficiently to the surface. As you start increasing your rotation rate, you, the mixing becomes more efficient and you end up being able to see these differences um, on your surface. Now, again, we know that our star should be rotating at around 320 kilometers per second, which corresponds to the dashed line. However, what we see is that the abundances that we measure from the 1D techniques in red and the uh, spams technique in blue, both of them are consistent with very low rotation rates. So, the abundances are telling us that the star does not appear to be efficiently mixed. So now we have a bit of a, a bit of a of an issue because our temperatures are saying that your stars appear mixed, whereas your abundances are telling you that your stars do not appear mixed. Now you may ask yourself, how accurate are, are our uh, abundance and and um, uh, temperature diagnostics? So, if we were to take the temperature that we measure and calculate what the corresponding abundance should be for helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and compare it to our uh, observed spectra. And this is what we would see. Now, our fits are in red, and the blue line corresponds to the abundance that we would expect based on the temperature. So for helium, you can see that we very nicely fit the abundance. However, the abundance that uh, it would be expected from your temperature does not match your spectra at all. And we can see the same thing for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as well. And this is again showing that we have a discrepancy between our temperature and our uh, abundances. So with that, I would like to uh, just uh, summarize quickly and mention again the main results that I've uh, listed here, uh, that a proper consideration of the 3D geometry is important for accurate parameter estimation that unaccounted for additional mechanisms produce similar component temperatures and unequal mass over contact binaries, and that observed temperatures and abundances cannot be reproduced with rotational mixing theory. 
And all of this was possible due to uh, uh, spams, uh, which in itself isn't really a scientific uh, uh, result, but it is a major deliverable of this thesis. Um, and with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael, for uh, your presentation. Uh, we enjoyed it. Uh, I would now like to open the discussion. And uh, so to open the discussion, uh, I will first uh, give the uh, opportunity to Professor Prasad from Villanova University in the US uh, to uh, ask you some questions. Michael, wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing this. and. Uh, first, let me extend uh, the compliment that you managed to uh, present a, a, a really complex and difficult subject on a level that uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that most of your audience was able to follow. Thank so you. I, I think you, you succeeded in this. Um, I have a few uh, quick questions and then one thought-provoking. So I'll start with a thought-provoking question. Imagine you had this perfect instrument that can see every single triangle on an over-contact binary that you are uh, demonstrating there. Uh, could you speculate, given the geometry, this uh, super precise spectrograph, where on the surface of an over-contact binary would you expect mixing to be most pronounced? I think I would expect the mixing to be most prominent uh, on the hottest regions of the star, so on the poles, because uh, the Eddington sweet circulations, the way they work is that they, they start uh, at the hotter regions of the star, go down over to the, uh, the cooler regions of the star, go down very close to the core, uh, and then come right back up. So um, since uh, the surface of your star that is and that will be the first to see the material that is down in the core will be the hotter regions. I would expect uh, there to be um, where you would see, um, yeah, the, the strongest evidence of this mixing. And the path is obviously the shortest, right? Yeah. Uh, near the poles. So uh, connected to that, let me, let me ask two uh, sub questions. The first one, could, could you tell the audience a little bit about what is the ratio of sizes of the core uh, with respect to the entire star. So the core is is fairly fairly tiny. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, yeah, it, it makes up a uh, drawn to scale. It, it makes up a very very tiny uh, region in the entire star. Right. So then uh, a naive question might be: If you grab this processed material through a mixing mechanism it's going to be heavy and you need to transfer it through an envelope that's effectively light. So naively, I would possibly expect that it would sink right back and it would never reach the surface. How would I, how, wh why am I wrong? Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, you, you still need to, to transport the, uh, uh, the energy away from from the core. So I mean, uh, uh, so because of that, I mean these these processed uh, when you're when you're mixing, you have much hotter material there that uh, that needs to that wants to dissipate its energy, um, and by getting to the surface, it's able to dissipate its energy. So so in that case, in that sense, it can kind of fight the uh, fight its weight in a sense. Okay. Yeah. So. One thing is buoyancy, the other thing is gravity, and then you have the, the temperature gradient that drives yes. energy transfer, right? Um, and since you're talking rotation uh, and, and stars are gaseous, right? My question is, is this rotation uh, reminiscent of a solid body? Or so if I look at a core itself, does it rotate as a solid body? And uh, does the envelope rotate as a solid body? Or is it more a differential rotation that you would expect? And what would the consequences be of either assumption? Um, well, if it were uh, solid throughout, uh, then you wouldn't have those shear instabilities that I mentioned before, because uh, your whole entire um, 
uh, surface or your whole entire star will be moving as one solid body. Um, so, so let me just clarify. I, I mean just the core and just the envelope. Ah, okay, not okay. The star yeah. as a whole. Well, your core is is very. You have a lot of convection going on in your core. So, um, I don't imagine uh, that it would be. Uh, I don't imagine that it would be a solid body because you have uh, a lot of angular momentum that's moving around in there, and I—that's uh, what I would—that's what I would say. Um, um, as for your envelope, uh, since you aren't having those movements, you—you uh, you can have it be you—you um, uh, uh, you, you don't have the mixing, so in that sense, you, you don't necessarily need to be moving the material around. Um, so you can uh, have a little bit more of a of closer to a solid body, but um, yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, I have to say this. I really enjoyed your clarification on the football shape, that it's an American <laughs> football shape. Yeah, I need um, to, especially uh, living here in Europe, I <laughs> need to make that clarification. Oh yeah. So let me ask my last question. Uh, you said that essentially 100% of massive stars come in binaries and multiple uh, systems. Why? Why is that? So it goes down to the, um, the star formation process. Um, as you're forming these massive stars, uh, instead of forming just a single core in the center of your gas, what ends up happening is uh, that due to the forces that are happening there, this often gets kind of... Uh, uh, separated um, and becomes unstable. So then you get multiple cores that begin to form. And uh, this is kind of how we get to binarity and higher order systems. So uh, also you can have systems that are much higher order than just binary. So you can have triple systems, quadruple systems, etc. cetera. Right. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would now like to give the opportunity uh, to our colleague Alex de Cotter for uh, continuing the discussion. So, dear Michael, I uh, very much uh, enjoyed uh, uh, working with you in this past four years. Uh, Thank you. Also, Likewise. Um, uh, very much liked uh, your thesis work. It's a beautiful piece of work. You should be very proud of it. Thank you very much. Um, I also thought that your expose was extremely clear. So uh, my compliments. Thank you. Um, but I do have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you went through quite some length during your expose to convince us that uh, the, there is a fundamental difference or an important difference between either fitting a binary system as if they are two single stars after you prepared the spectrum eh, in in this uh, in this uh, disentangling using this disentangling technique, or that you use what you call your spams uh, method, uh, that you just uh, fit them simultaneously, basically accounting for all sorts of uh, deformations and uh, eh, and um, um, effects and like that. And then I read your chapter four, mm -hmm. where you actually test this method. Mm -hmm. yeah, the two methods to figure out how much different they are. Mm -hmm. And actually you conclude in that chapter that the results are actually quite similar. Yeah. So and so my, my so my 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 first question would be why so similar? Yeah? So that would be my first question. Sure. So um, the aspects of the fits that are that are so similar are uh, the abundances mainly. So the abundances uh, agree very well between the two methods uh, for the CNO elements. Um, now, the temperatures we do see a little bit of a, of a difference between the two, which I pointed out uh, during the presentation that uh, uh, when you use spams, you tend to get higher temperatures, but However, only by a thousand Kelvin. Yeah, yeah. Which, sure. given the uncertainty of the, the intrinsic uncertainty of both methods, yes, is not significantly different, I would say. 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in these specific cases, uh, it's okay, uh, or, or rather the, the single, um, the spherically symmetric models uh, do a pretty good job. Uh, however, there are other situations uh, where this is not necessarily the case. So for example, if you're looking at uh, uh, w what I mentioned with the rapidly rotating single star systems that, that, you, that you can really see this difference. But the other point that, that I'll make is that um, the parameters that we get out are, 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 are fairly similar. But uh, when you actually look at the, the fits that we're getting from, from spams, they, they do appear to fit the spectra uh, a bit better, which is which is also another important thing. So, so uh, it's building confidence in our in our methods, and and um, in that sense, uh, showing that that uh, even though uh, we are getting um, similar parameters from from both methods, uh, that uh, taking into account the geometry um, is still important uh, for fitting the for fitting the stars. No, I, I would agree with that. I mean, there's one. Uh, the parameter that uh, you introduce in that particular chapter saying is also very important, which is the surface gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, you do not involve surface gravity in this comparison. Because you do not return to the issue of surface gravity later on in the paper. So my question would be, why not? And um, And also, how would you actually compare surface gravi gravities in these two methods, because as you ex have explained, the surface gravity is not a constant over the surface, as is, by the way, the temperature. Yep. But, but OK, so so what about the surface gravity? Sure. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the surface gravity and the temperature are very intimately connected. So uh, uh, by so if we're able to fit uh, the temperature properly, um, or rather, rather uh, the same things that we're seeing with the temperature, we would also expect to observe with, with the surface gravity. Um, if we wanted to compare the two, uh, what I would think would be a good way of doing it is we have what the um, intensities are at each triangle across the surface of the mesh grid. Um, we can weight the surface gravities that we're having at each point on the, along the surface by those intensities, because the intensity is telling us how much light we're getting and, and um, from that individual triangle. Um, and we could figure out what the, uh, the intensity averaged surface gravity would be for each component of the star. Um, so you could use that and see how that compares to the spherical, uh, to the gravity, the surface gravity that we get from the spherical model. Um, and I would say that that would be a decent comparison because I mean, um, what's happening during your disentangling procedure is that you're smearing the the uh, the signal out. Um, uh, you, yeah, you're you're smearing the the different surface patches um, out. So uh, it should be a uh, intensity averaged uh, surface gravity that we're getting out. So by comparing those two, I think that that would be a, a good way of testing it to see. Um, OK, so I will propose you do this test. My final question, so and the, and the brief answer, I think. What's next in terms of spams modeling? Yeah, um, so spams can be used for a lot of things aside from just over contact systems. You can use it for rapidly rotating systems. You can also use it for uh, semi-detached systems. Um, but I would say the, the major thing that I'd like to do next with spams is to uh, address the, the winds a little bit better. Because currently, um, the way that we handle the winds, I didn't really get into this in the presentation, uh, isn't very optimal. Um, and we make some assumptions that uh, are not necessarily, I would say, but we can improve on the treatment of the winds. I'll put it that way. So th that would be the first thing that I would, that I would look at um, to improve winds. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so I now like to give uh, the floor to uh, Professor Michael De Becker from uh, Liège University to continue the discussion. Okay, um, Michael, it was challenging to, um, to reconcile the fact that you had to do something that should be pedagogical and to talk about a difficult science topic, and you did it. Really, I really appreciated your presentation. Uh, very clear, very nice. And uh, after that, I had maybe a, a few questions. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to come back to uh, a previous question about the binary fraction about massive stars. So about the statement that about 100% of massive stars should be in binary systems. Well, actually, how do we know that? Did we observe enough massive stars to, uh, to be sure about that? So what is your opinion about that? Yeah, so um, these figures are based on observations uh, of massive star clusters and looking at the number of, of binaries that we see in these clusters. Uh, and, and from that, uh, correcting for observational biases. So for example, uh, if you're looking at your star like this and it's rotating like this, you're never going to be able to detect that it's a binary. Um, so correcting for all, of, for all of those observational biases, uh, we come up with a number that 100% of binary systems are uh, uh, are formed in math, in binary systems. Okay, so uh, the, that statement is not incompatible with the fact that for some stars uh, said to be uh, presumably single stars, uh, we can observe them a lot and a lot and a lot and never see uh, any uh, information about uh, or, or any hints about the presence of a companion, actually. Yeah, so there's that and then there's also the idea that Massive stars can also merge. So they can begin their lives as binaries and then merge and form a single star. And then you have something that is a single star, but didn't begin its life that way. So that, that began its life as a binary. So you also have, have that as well, which comes into, into your, your, your bias correction. So, you know, also the age of, of your, your cluster that you're looking at, so. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe another question about, uh, your prospects for future investigations. In your uh, manuscript, you talk about uh, observation of more systems uh, to apply your, your tools, notably spam. And uh, I had a question about your observation strategies. Which kind of observation strategies would you imagine, uh, notably in terms of time sampling of your uh, uh, time series? Um, can you talk about that? Sure. So. Um one of the things that I think is very important is expanding our sample size. So right now we only have eight massive overcontact binaries. Uh, so doing any sort of statistical analysis of your sample is very difficult because of how few stars you have. And we expect that 25% of, of stars will undergo an over, or sorry, 25% of massive stars will undergo an overcontact phase. So we expect to see a lot more of them. And the fact that we don't see them is interesting and, and uh, we want to look to see if there are more out there. So by looking at uh, missions such as TESS, um, which is you know, looking at uh, the photometry of, of these stars, uh, we can see if we can detect um, more of these overcontact systems, which we can then follow up later with spectroscopy uh, to analyze uh, the mixing that's happening in them. So that's kind of my strategy is first look for more of them using the uh, photometry, characterize them, and then the uh, candidates that are, um, you know, potentially the best uh, uh, ones for, for mixing, uh, we follow up with spectroscopy. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe a, a last question, um, maybe a naive question, but uh, you're talking a lot about uh, stellar rotation. It is a main topic of your, your work. And I was wondering if you had to, to explain to your students uh, why stars are rotating? How would you proceed? Sure. So when the star, before the star is even born, it starts its life as a giant cloud of gas, which collapses down. Uh, and as that happens, you have to conserve angular momentum. So again, in the same way that, uh, as I mentioned, when the skater pulls their arms in, they begin to spin faster. The same thing happens um, in these clouds of gas. So because of that, you know that there needs to be rotation, there, there needs to be angular momentum in your star somewhere, okay? We also know that uh, just from observations that most uh, massive stars uh, are rotating fast. Uh, and um, another important factor uh, in that is that as since your core is shrinking as it evolves, uh, I think the figure is something like it'll uh, shrink by about nine orders of magnitude. Uh, because of that, uh, it will any rotation that the core has, even if it's very slight, will be magnified. 
Uh, and if the core is spinning faster than its uh, critical rotation, then it'll tear itself apart. So you know there needs to be mixing, which will transport angular momentum away from the core and into the envelope, so which will also um, make sure that the star itself is, is spinning. It's OK. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to give the word to Professor Kathleen Kohlenberg to continue our discussion. Hi, Michael. Hi, Kathleen. I would also like to extend my sincere congratulations because you gave an excellent talk. It was beautifully okay. explained. And uh, as Andre already said, I think everyone could follow. And it's, it's not an easy topic to explain to yeah. everyone. So wonderful. I also liked the 3D model of the overcomplex. So that's a nice touch. Uh, so since we are in the educationally uh, in, on the educational road now, because you gave such a good presentation, how would you explain to students uh, that uh, mixing intends to increase the surface temperature? Sure. So as your uh, as your stars are, are mixing, you're bringing a lot of the, the, the hot material from down inside of the core uh, to the surface, for one thing. Uh, and because of that, your surface is going to appear hotter uh, because you're, you're, you're bringing material up. Uh, furthermore, um, as you're mixing, you're uh, increasing your, you're increasing, uh, okay, in the core, <laughs> you have, uh, as it's converting hydrogen into helium, you're increasing the mean molecular weight. So, so the average weight of your particles inside of the core. And uh, this tends to also increase your, your temperatures because uh, your stars can, can uh, contract and, and, and become um, uh, uh, warmer. Uh, and as you have the mixing, you're distributing this material throughout your entire star. So because of that, you, in that sense, you, you you are moving uh, uh, the hot material from near the core up to the envelope, uh, but you're also increasing the mean molecular weight, which will increase your temperature. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And another one is uh, why is LTE not uh, usable, applicable in massive stars? Yeah, because massive stars are, are, are so hot. Um, the temperature, the temperature gradients are much are much uh, stronger in massive stars. So because of that, uh, if you're just looking at a local region, uh, your temperature is going to be changing a lot more than than in a lower mass star. Um, so because of that, uh, yeah, the the LTE is no longer valid in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so do you have any idea why you don't see any more of those under um, over context systems? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, it's a it's a very interesting thing that we don't see more of them. Uh, um, it's it's something that uh, I don't understand at the moment, and which is why I think that it's important for us to get more observations of these systems. It could just be that nobody's looking for them, so people haven't found them, um, uh, or it could be that uh, instead of uh, this being a long-lasting phase like we expected to, it could be a short-lived phase and the stars could uh, merge much quicker than we expect. Um, mm -hmm. So by doing a systematic study, we can determine which one of those is true, whether uh, they're there and we just don't see them or whether uh, they really aren't there. And then, then we need to look at our models and, and try to decide uh, uh, why they're not there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And finally, your work pointed out that there is a discrepancy between the abundances that you see and the temperatures. What what is the what's the missing link there? What are these? Uh, do you have some idea? Yeah. So um, this is another interesting thing because our models can't really reproduce this. So uh, it could have something to do with the fact that uh, these are binary systems, and there could be additional mixing mechanisms. I mean, the stars are in over contact, so there is mixing of material between the two stars, and, and this extra mixing um, could affect that in some way. However, uh, the mixing should also increase your um, your abundances. So, I mean, 
uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a difficult uh, thing to to um, compensate in that sense. So it could be, like I said, could be a, a result of, of the binary nature of these. But um, we'll need to look more into this to really figure out where this is coming from. Okay. And are you going to do that next? I'd like to. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. I, I'd like to, to to look into that to figure out where that's coming from. And I think that looking at the other systems to see if this is common for the overcontact binaries or just unique to these two that we've observed it in so far. Um, I think that'll help uh, to determine, uh, to narrow that down a little bit more. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, I'd like to hand the discussion to uh, Professor John Zundqvist from the Institute of Astronomy. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, very nice presentation and uh, congrats again uh, to a very nice uh, PhD thesis and, uh, and a piece of work. I really enjoyed working with you these years and I certainly hope that we will continue to do so. Uh, as for some further questions today, we have already had a lot, but I wanted to follow up. One of them was partly addressed already. Uh, you sort of hinted that it was puzzling uh, in your answer to, to the other Michael, to Becca. Uh, but I wanted to, to, to continue along this road. So you, you do claim that the expected fraction of, of binaries in massive stars is 100%. But yet, the effective fraction of stars in your phase, the overcontact phase, is extremely low. Uh, no, not the expected, the observed fraction. Yeah? So aren't these two contradicting each other then? And if not, why don't you think that there are more observations of stars in, in this particular phase? Sure. So. We expect that 25% of these stars will enter the contact phase at some point in their lives. Now, whether that happens early in their lives or late in their lives uh, is dependent on the their initial configuration of the system. So it could just be that uh, we are not looking in the right places, that we're looking at uh, uh, clusters that are too young, for example, or, or that uh, um, or like I mentioned before, that the contact phase doesn't last as long as we expect it to, that the stars merge and uh, that's it. So uh, yeah, I mean, those, those are the, the two possibilities that I would say that um, well, could also just be that, yeah, people haven't been looking for them. So right. um, they're yeah. not so easy to, to detect, but it could be that the fraction is actually a little bit smaller than this 25% as well because of the Times Well, I think that the twenty-five percent is fairly. I think that one is fairly well uh, understood because that's based on the configurations uh, of the stars. So I mean, uh, um, we. I mean, if you have a star that merges, then it will at some point go through a contact. Phase, whether it's a common envelope phase or whether it's a, an overcontact system in the way that we see it, um, they will merge. So, uh, I I would expect that um, that it has more to do with uh, observational biases or that the that it lasts not as long as we expect than the twenty five percent. But I could be wrong. So, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, and then I had one more small question, and that has to do with something that we discussed uh, previously. So let's see if you have given it some thought. So when you're patching together your, your uh, basically fast moon models to your CB patches using these small, very nice triangles that you illustrated, basically in order to attach a fast moon model, um, uh, you have to consider the force balance in order to get the, 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 the correct, uh, uh, as Alex was also pointing out, surface gravities, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, when you calculate this, basically, in the star, in hydrostatic equilibrium, so you put them up and down, you're considering radiation forces, gas pressure forces, but no rotation forces. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in Phoebe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're considering radiation forces and gas pressure forces, but no, no. you're considering rotational forces, 
gas pressure, but no radiation forces. Yes, I, I believe so, yes. Yeah. So how do you then make sure that you're attaching the correct fastwind model to the correct TV model? Yeah. Um, so the way that we do it now is we base it on your surface gravity, your temperature, and your radius. Um, and we assume that, uh, that it's a good enough approximation for each individual triangle. Um, however, that, that's, that, that is a good point. Uh, it would be interesting to see, I suppose, uh, if you did take into account um, uh, the radiation forces, how that would affect it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, the radiation forces on, on, on the side of Phoebe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the yeah. other hand, rotation forces on the, the, on the side of Phoebe. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so it's a bit easier to take care of the rotation. Well, no, it, it's a bit easier to account for it after the fact. Um, rather with fast wind models, uh, when you fit uh, your your uh, uh, surface gravity to uh, a star that's rotating, um, for example, uh, the gravity or the surface gravity that you're going to get, um, uh, once you apply the um, uh, the rotation to it, uh, you can kind of uh, Create a, a rotation correction to the surface gravity that you that you get out. Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit easier to go on fast wind side to see how that how that changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. My intuition says that it should be safe, it should be possible to do something similar in feed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd, that'd be interesting to to look into. You yeah. for the radiation. Okay, yeah, that was uh, uh, from my side. And again, congratulations to uh, uh, a very nice uh, uh, piece of work and presentation today. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, so now, before I hand uh, the floor to your promoter, I'd like to ask a few questions myself. And sure. uh, since since I didn't have the luck to collaborate with you, I can I can you know pretend I don't know anything and, and pull you <laughs> out of your comfort zone. So, um, of course, congratulations with the very nice work. And also congratulations indeed with the way you introduced the topic uh, in a very clear way. Uh, and so to start with, you, you, you convinced us about uh, the, the potential uh, importance of these uh, chemically homogeneous evolution scenarios that you, that you are focusing on. And you explained, for instance, how, uh, well, you know, the rotation is sort of inevitable, especially during the formation with your, with your ice skater. But, um, you know, as you increase rotation, you would also increase any kind of primordial magnetic field that would be present there. So how about magnetic field? And remember that you were talking about the significance of the velocity shear between the core and the envelope, uh, which, okay, it's, it's like a different situation and in, in the solar case that I'm more familiar with, but that precise region where core and envelope meet each other is very important for the solar dynamo. And so again, differential rotation and everything you explained would be very important for magnetic fields and dynamo generation. So since you probably don't know much about that, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Uh, uh... As you said, I don't know much about that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, the, magnetic, the magnetic fields would certainly um, affect this uh, in some way. I know that uh, uh, stars that exhibit strong magnetic fields um, uh, can magnetically break themselves, so, so can, can slow their rotation. Um, I'm not sure exactly how the internal magnetic fields would, uh, would operate here. I'm not exactly sure how exactly would it affect this picture? Out, out of all the spectroscopic information you have over these systems, there is perhaps no indication that you should be worried about magnetic fields? That I know of off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Um, I know that there, I mean, you can uh, see if see if your, your lines are, 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 see if there's any polarization in there to check to see if you are seeing magnetic fields, but um, I 
don't know if anyone has ever done this for an over-contact system or what the results would be of that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. And another question that I had as follows. So uh, suppose I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, not, not, not into this field like you are, uh, and then I, I, I look at it as follows. You, know, you, you, you were wanting to fit spectra that are very complex because the systems you are interested in happen to be very complex systems. Mm -hmm. And there's a basic rule in, 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 in statistics, you know, like if you wanna fit, you know, then, then the more degrees of freedom you add, the more you can fit. Yeah. So uh, in your spams approach, you, in a sense, if I put it impolitely, you gave an, as many degrees of freedom as you, as you have triangles on your, on your surface. So uh, when does spams become spam in the sense that you start to overfit your problem? So uh, let me kind of clarify here is that the triangles uh, are the, so we're not fitting for each individual triangle. We're fitting for the surface as a whole, which is a combination of all of those triangles. However, the parameters at each of those triangles are determined based on uh, uh, the structure of the star. So it isn't something that uh, you can't just play with one specific triangle and, and adjust it uh, to uh, uh, get a better uh, fit. You need to adjust the entire star at the same time. So in that sense, you're not so actually if you, if you if you were to you know what what typically is done in, in numerical computations uh where you are concerned more with the dynamics or, or with like this equilibrium structure if you were to double or quadruple the number of triangles you would you would hope to converge on something is the same true for sort of the spectral information that you are in after if you double or quadruple the number of triangles in your in your fee part of the spams model. So if you increase your, so increasing your triangles would give you better resolution on how the surface changes. However, I think a, a more limiting factor here is the resolution of the grid that we're using um, for the input fast one models. Uh, so this is a fairly coarse grid. I mean, uh, the, the, the steps in temperature are a thousand uh, Kelvin. So, um, uh, if you were to, uh, you would get a much better, uh, uh, I guess, convergence by increasing the fast wind grid itself, I think, than, than if you were to increase uh, the Phoebe mesh uh, triangles. Okay, I accept that answer. So thank you very much. And uh, I'd now like to give the floor to uh, your promoter, uh, Professor Yuxana. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Well, thank you, Michael, for the presentation. I think that we have had many, many opportunities to talk and I've been asking you many questions over the last four years. So I don't have questions for today, but I see that there's one question in the chat and I'm going to ask it. It's from Connor House, who's from Villanova, I think. Given spams filing and the abundance of binaries, would this suggest stellar populations are in general bluer than previously thought? What is your opinion about this? May read it one more time? So given SPAM's findings and the abundance yeah. of binaries, does that suggest that slab populations are in general bluer? Um, not necessarily. So I mean, maybe very slightly. Uh, the other thing that you, that you need to keep in mind is that you only really see very big deviations as the deviations from spherical symmetry become large. Um, so. In most cases, the deviations are so small that your uh, uh, the changes in your parameters are going to be very small. We happen here to be looking at some of the most distorted systems that you can find. So for that reason, this is where you really start to see this difference. Um, and it becomes important when you're looking at these distorted systems. However, for the most part, uh, uh, I don't think it, it'll, it'll make a very big difference at all in, uh, in uh, the clusters in general. All right, thank you, Michael. Thanks. Okay, so indeed, uh, this is a public defense. Uh, so uh, people 
are actually uh, allowed to ask questions uh, in the uh, in the live stream. I see a few coming, and so here is one. Uh, William Ambrosino is wondering if there exist broader applications of the spams code outside of over -conference. Sure. So um, as I mentioned, it can be used for uh, uh, single rapidly rotating stars. It can also be used for um, uh, uh, semi-detached systems where, where that are also distorted. But it can also be used for even just regular binaries that uh, don't uh, exhibit very strong um, distortion. Uh, and you can. Uh, model some effects, uh, such as uh, the struve sahada effect or the Rosader-McLaughlin effect, um, which uh, have to do with, uh, which are effects that you see as the stars are eclipsing one another. Um, and if you're not taking into account the 3D geometry, um, you aren't able to uh, reproduce these effects. So for example, um, ones as if you have a rapidly rotating star and another star passes in front of it, uh, it's going to be covering up uh, certain regions of the star, so you're going to affect the spectral lines that you're seeing from uh, the star behind it. So uh, it has a much broader application um, than just over contact binaries. Um, yeah. Okay, here's another one. Edward Bachmakov is asking for the biggest bottleneck for increasing the quality or reducing the uncertainty in your models. Okay. Um, so I'd say the biggest bottleneck right now in increasing uh, uh, the quality is, is, is just computation power. So to uh, fit one of these models uh, first, um, even if we want to do it uh, without using spams, if we just want to want to do it the traditional method, um, fitting one of these stars takes about a week on a supercomputer to fit. Um, if we want to use spams, we need to compute a large grid of, of input models uh, uh, before we can actually begin using the fitting for, for any of these things. Um, uh, and these models take a very long time to compute. Uh, so I would say that, that is a big bottleneck and also space, memory, storage. So I mean, the, the, uh, the size of my grids right now are in the terabytes. Uh, so to um, be able to use this um, uh, Reliably, we need uh, more space to store the, the, the input models uh, and that kind of thing. So I think those are the biggest bottlenecks right now for this to become, um, uh, for it to be used much broader in that sense. Thank you very much. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the live comments. It looks like we've asked those that were posted so far. Um, so with that, uh, being the situation, if it doesn't change anytime soon, then uh, I now suggest that uh, the jury retreats uh, for the deliberation, and then we will uh, come back with uh, the uh, outcome very soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I will now proclaim the result of the deliberation by the examination committee appointed for the doctoral degree in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. Mr. Michael Abdul Masi has presented to the faculty his PhD thesis on the topic spectroscopy of spherically distorted massive stars testing internal mixing and stellar evolution. Impartial fulfillment of the requirements for the PhD in science, astronomy, and astrophysics. And he has defended his thesis in a public session before the examination committee and before the public. The examination committee has determined that all requirements concerning the granting of the doctoral degree that are prescribed by the law and by the university regulations have been met. Therefore, on behalf of the rector of KU Leuven, I confer you upon Mr. Michael Abdul Masi the degree of Doctor in Science, Astronomy and Astrophysics. And with this, I officially close this session. Uh, at the end of this session, I would like to, well, congratulate uh, Dr. Michael Abdul Masi and then uh, give the word to his promoter uh, to uh, give some final comments in this. Thank you. Well, Michael, Dr. Michael, <laughs> I'm very glad to be the first one to congratulate you. And that's easier if I'm the only one allowed to speak, of course. <laughs> Dear Dr. Michael, dear family Abdul Masi, what a trip. Michael, I'm not sure that you knew what you were signing up for when you took the offer of this PhD back in 2016, but this has been quite eventful. I rem remember you interview very well. At that time, Professor Alex de Coder told me, you know, Hugh, this one is smart. And he was right. So over the last four years, you've experienced a different rhythm of research from the slow building up of expertise and the many testing of your new methodology to the excitements of the last six months, where you, all your efforts have made you a world-class expert in massive binaries, able to spot critical shortcomings in published work supported by over four dozens of experienced scientists. That was quite an achievement, quite a moment we had there. You also have seen the group and the Institute growing immensely over that period, and you could adapt and find opportunities in these growths. While Connie Arts has had to wait for many years for her to get her first US PhD student, who by the way graduated just a week ago, I'm very glad that I managed to beat her for once, all thanks to you. But Michael, I certainly want to thank and congratulate you for your work over the last four years. But I also want to thank and congratulate your family for their hard work over the almost last three decades to raise, educate, and to support you becoming the fine you're glad that you are. I certainly have had the pleasure to see you grow as a person from a somewhat reserved, nice guy to a much more confident, but still nice person. In the last four years, you've been entering my office a countless number of times, always starting with the same sentence. Hi, Hugh, do you have a minute? <laughs> of course, an hour later, we were still chatting and debating your results and the next steps to take to validate the new analysis method that you were designing. And this was both fun and pleasant. I've always appreciated you down the earth, no bullshit approach, where you could clearly explain what you did and why you did it, and also what you knew and what you did not know, which is probably one of the most fundamental quality in a good of a good scientist. Of course, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the members of your thesis committee, Professor Alex de Coter and Michael de Becker, that have followed your PhD year by year. And I also want to give special thanks to Professor Andre Pshar and John Sunquist, that have been of great help in bridging Phoebe and Fastwind, which are the two main ingredients of your SPAMS patch surface model, and whose help has been invaluable during your thesis. Michael, while your PhD have brought us to many places around the world, there's one thing that I do regret, is that I did not have the opportunity to take you to Chile for an observing trip. But I understood that this has been solved, as you will spend the next three years of your life there, and I'm certainly planning to come and visit, especially since you're not the only person at the IVS going there. Sounds good. 
to, to celebrate your achievements and your new chapter of your personal and professional life that will soon start. I was planning to get you a taste of chili, <laughs> right? As long as a few other items, but this will have to wait for a proper celebration that I hope we can have before you sail away from Leuven. And in the meantime, I congratulate you one more time for your work and I wish you all the best for the future. And as some popular TV show have been saying, may we meet again. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'd also like to say some words. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for all of uh, the, the support that you've given me throughout the, the, the past four years. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, even uh, do the PhD to begin with. Uh, and um, I think that uh, our discussions and um, uh, working with you has always been a, a very pleasant experience and I've enjoyed it immensely. And, uh, um, I think that the, you know, my success in, in getting uh, the fellowship at Chile uh, also is, is very much uh, thanks to, to your efforts in, in, uh, in cultivating a good scientific uh, I guess, uh, you know, sense in me. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, uh, thank you for, for always uh, being willing to talk, uh, even if our discussions did end up turning longer than that moment that I asked for. Um, and thank you for always being available for uh, all of these discussions and for always also being uh, a down to earth in that sense with, with, uh, with helping explain to me things and, and, um, and not getting frustrated when I wasn't understanding something and all of that. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the committee for all of their uh, uh, their comments and their questions uh, throughout the process. Um, I really think that my thesis is is in a much better state now than it was uh, when I handed it over to you guys. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank um, uh, the collaborators throughout uh, my time uh, here in Leuven. So um, especially uh, Alex and Jan uh, and Andre as well. Uh, who uh, have really helped me um, throughout this process. So thank you very much uh, to them. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the members of the IVS who have made uh, this such a pleasant place to work and who've uh, really grown to be a, a close second family for me. So um, thank you to all of you. And a uh, special thank you to Anna who has, uh, you know, I don't know where I would be without her through all of this. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, to her and I'm very excited to um, go on this next adventure with you. So um, thank you for that. Um, and uh, I guess also thank you to all of the viewers who came to watch today and uh, took this journey with me. So um, thank you and I hope you enjoyed and I hope to see you all soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>